All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Clace. I'm a UW-Madison Extension Forestry Specialist. And today we're going to talk a bit about some of the programs that are available to woodland owners who want to get some stuff done in their woods. Hello. Uh, I want to mute your mic. I see, I'm going to mute Steve. Okay, or uh, yes. So, today, so uh, today we've got speakers from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Natural Resource Conservation Service to talk about programs that uh, they offer to woodland owners uh, to help, like I said, get things done. And if, especially if you have some projects in mind, uh, we'll have time for questions. You can pose them in the chat if you'd like, as I said, or, or we will have some time that you can prefer to ask them live. We can do that as well. But to get started, we'll get uh, some views from Kara, who's a forester in northern Wisconsin with the Wisconsin DNR. I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and uh, you can get started with your presentation. Wonderful. Again, my name is Kara Okerinen. I'm a forester ranger for Wisconsin DNR. And you'll run into a lot of forester rangers or forester types with DNR across the state. We do state lands planning. We help with the county. We help with the Forest Service. We do fire suppression, and every DNR forester also has a whole list of uh, passion projects they may or may, may include you in. So here is the presentation. Bill, how does that look? Yeah, it looks great. Great. And the main program that we do is the Wisconsin, Landow Wisconsin Forest Landowner Grant Program. Oh. I'm trying to switch. Oh, there we go. It's just a little slow. Everything I say, you'll be able to reference online. There's an about the program sheet that you see there. The application's available online. You'll also be required to fill out a W-9. And then to keep track of all the expenses, we have an expense ledger that also helps. Because we're a state agency, you can find all of the rules. If you want to go wild, there is a private lands handbook that you can find to see all of the bolts of this program. So Wisconsin Forest Landowner Grant Program, you'll keep hearing us call it Wiffle Gap. The reason we do it is to help private landowners do non-commercial forest practices on their land. Because if it's a commercial pro project, you can hire someone, and they'll do it and they'll improve your woods and you can make some money off of it. So what we wanna help people do is those little odd side projects that are gonna have a benefit down the road, but are gonna cost people money up front. So you have to have 10 acres, but no more than 500 in the state of Wisconsin. And you can be reimbursed. So you gotta put all that money down first for up to 50% of the eligible expenses within eligible practices. And there is also a not to exceed rate. So to explain that further, um, you'll see examples of what is cost shareable and what is not. And the not to exceed rate means if you're going to say, have a plan made for your, your property, you've got 10 acres, we have a not to exceed rate of how much we will reimburse per acre. Because if you have someone charge you $10,000 for a 10 acre plan, we're not going to reimburse you for $5,000. It'll be up to the not to exceed rate. Some of you may already have management plans for your property. Great. With that in hand and all of the projects listed within the plan, you'll be ready to, to apply for cost sharing. But if you don't have it yet, or you want an update on that plan, you can apply to have one of those plans written. And that, notice that last bullet point says you must have a plan or be applying for one. Um, you can have practices within your application as well as, and I will be getting a plan written. Next thing you gotta do is understand what can be cost shared. Some examples are plan creation, some updating of that, tree planting, direct seeding. There's a picture of an, a walnut cedar and one of our direct seeding applications. Invasive plant control. And this is one that a lot of people wanna do. 
So I added that bullet of if the invasives impact forest regeneration. Invasive plant control is a passion of mine, but it's not a one and done project. And this needs to result in creating tree growth because otherwise it's in controlling a plant for the sake of controlling it. And it would eat up a lot of this cost share money. Site preparation for planting trees, excluding and protecting seedlings. And if you tuned into some of the other presentations, you may have heard the term TSI, timber stand improvement tossed about. And this will take over a year typically to get your grant. So have this plan in hand ahead of time and it is first come first serve. So even though the bulk of grants are awarded on August 1st, I want you to apply today because you reserve a spot in line and you'll stay in that line until you're funded. And you need to find a forester. You can use a private consulting forester for a lot of your plan and a lot of the project but you also should connect with the DNR forester so you can actually sign up. Um, we'll talk you through the timing of your project. We'll help you fill out your application. I usually fill out most of it for folks, and then I gather all the information and submit it for you. Forestry Assistance Locator. You can Google Forestry Assistance Locator Wisconsin or type in that address, and then you'll find um, your DNR forester. All right. If everybody's alive, does anyone want to anyone want to throw in the chat which one of these lists is the cost shareable types of expenses and which are not? Or unmute yourselves either way. Oh, I hear nothing. Crickets. Bill, help me out. Yeah, I'm. Oh, this this is a good list. I'm I'm looking at it. and I'm confused too. <laughs> okay. Oh, 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 good, but bad. <laughs> As someone said, the list on the left is cost shareable. How how does that? Yeah, that is totally correct. I I know ah. you guys kind of know this, but these are just examples. And as you apply for your grant, um, if you're not sure, you can talk through it with the DNR forester, and then I always recommend following things up with an email from our conversation, I understood the following. And then, okay, good to go. Um, all right, on to the next. So as a DNR forester, if I'm looking at a grant application, you can get up to $10,000 of cost sharing. But if you just bought this land and you have never done a grant or a project before and you don't have a contractor lined up, what would be best for you and best for the program is to start with maybe one acre instead of 10 or even a half acre of timber stand improvement or of um, invasives removal, something like that. And then also call ahead and ask some contractors, do you do this kind of work? How, how much lead time do you need? Do you think you might be available next spring? You may get a contractor that says, oh yeah, we take those projects real quick, or I book out two years in advance. So have those things kind like ready and explored as you apply. So you submitted your application, your W-2, you've talked to me or your other forester, and now we just wait. Any work that you do has to be cost shareable, has to be done once you receive a letter in the mail. It's a physical letter. Once you have it in your hot little hand, you're ready to go. But anything you buy or work on before that letter is with you is not going to be cost shareable. So you'll get that letter. It'll probably be dated, say, August 1st. So you have two years from that August 1st, dead, August 1st award letter to get your project complete. If you're starting to say, uh-oh, after two months, I don't know that I can get this complete, call your DNR forester and 
we may have to cancel your grant or maybe we're looking at applying for a small extension, something like that. For the greatest good for you and other people in Wisconsin, we want to make sure that when the money is encumbered and given to you that it can get used because the money doesn't just go back into a big pool, it leaves our program. So we want all of this money to be spread out to landowners who are doing good things on the land. So keep in contact with us about your progress and any, any problems or great successes you have. All right, you got that award letter. Start your work right away. Again, because that will help you understand how it's going, if you need extra help. We don't want to wait till the 11th hour to find out that something is harder than you expected. One of the biggest things that you need to do in order to get your money is to keep a very good record of your expenses. In-kind labor was listed as one of those cost shareable expenses. So that's your time that you put on the land. Give me the date, the hours, and what you did. And I'm going to connect that back to the part of your grant that is cost shareable. And you will receive an expense ledger, just an example of how to keep track of stuff from us. And that last bullet is keep your DNR Forester up to date as your project progresses. That can be through, I prefer emails and pictures are great. And there's an example of the cost ledger. Um, you see the Wiffle Gap eligible practice. So, you know, tree planting site preparation. Be very detailed about which eligible practice you're um, recording your information for. When your practice is complete, or even if you're half done, you can get a partial reimbursement midway through your project. Reach out to your DNR forester, show them the records. I will probably visit your property, but if you give me a bunch of photos with GPS locations and a date, I may be able to just use that, or I mean, more than likely I will visit your property. And notice that is after I do that, I fill out the reimbursement information and you get a check for up to 50% of the eligible expenses. So it may be less than what you were originally hoping for. Um, for example, if you were going to plant 1000 trees per acre, but you only plant 800, you'll get a smaller reimbursement. So real quick to review, this is an in-demand program. We, we use up all of our money every year. Contact your DNR forester right away, keep them informed. Don't start your project until you get the official award letter in your hand. And if you want reimbursement, you must keep a record of that. Some of those records are that expense ledger, receipts, a canceled check from your payment to a land management company, and make sure that you complete your project on time. That is the main Wiffle Gap program page. And this is a picture of some non-commercial crop tree release. What questions do you guys have? And there's a little more information if we get into it. I've, I've got a quick question for you, Kara, about uh, sure. how frequent to contact you while work is going on. Should it be like, hey, we did the tree planting yesterday or we picked up the trees, we we uh, we just started work. You know, what's too much and too much contact and, and not enough mm. contact? Ooh. Ooh, this is like any relationship. You got to work that out with your forester. <laughs> um, because I wouldn't mind a lot of contact. For example, someone was doing a direct seeding of oak this fall. And he sent me texts like, we're picking up the acorns today. Hey, I'm trying the, um, I'm disking today. And in my work day, I actually managed to like scoot out there and see some of that in progress, take some pictures. But, you know, for someone, if maybe you're getting a plan written, it's like, we contacted a forester today. I'm like, well, cool, but there's nothing for me to see there. Um, but I would say, keep in contact and just ask your forester, like, how much do you want to know? Because they might be like, I'm really busy and I know you got this. 
you've done it three other times before and the contractor you're working for or working with is very experienced, they may not want to know. But just ask your forester how much contact they want and then do keep records on that day, that day-to-day -day stuff. Picked up the trees, put them in the ground. Because if, like if a person who hasn't planted trees, if you text your DNR forester and say, we picked them up today, we're planning on planting them next month, That'll be a red flag for me to be like, excuse me, are you planning on leaving those trees in the hot sun? <laughs> so just keeping in contact with a forester, you might get more information than you thought. All right. I got another question for you. In one of the slides you mentioned, you must continue practice for 10 years. What, what does that mean? So if you stick trees in the ground and you got a tree planting practice, you need to maintain those. So if you decide, actually, I'm going to convert that back to a hay field, then you violated your grant and that's not acceptable. And what if it like it's a invasive plant control? What is there a 10 year like it does that mean you continue to have to continue to work on it for 10 years or is the what's what's your what's your thoughts on that? That is a really interesting one that I've never I've never answered that question before. So I would to get the official answer, I may go back to um, one of our program leads. But I would say you need to maintain the growth potential of your trees mm. for ten years because when when we battle invasives, it's oftentimes a forever battle. And with Wiffle Gap, we are doing it because it impacts tree regeneration. So if you get the buckthorn out in little finger quotes, not really, it's coming back because you get a seed bank and you manage to get a crop of that mid tolerant, mid shade, mid sun needing trees up above the buckthorn and they're going to make it to adult tree, tree status and you have some buckthorn seedlings underneath, I would still say that that practice is maintained because you got that crop of seedlings to survive and will survive into being adult trees. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. And that's, that was a great example. Um, the mid tolerant trees. Yeah. Um, is that a common part of the invasive plant control application that I want to release? I'm releasing me these other seedlings that I want that, the trees that I want. That is what I, that is definitely something that I want to have a discussion about and document. So yes. Okay, you know, buckthorn on the edge of a field for the sake of the edge of the field. I want you to do it regardless, but I may not be able to cost share that if it is not actively impeding the regeneration of your trees. I mean, I, if it is not impeding trees, I will not be able to cost share it. I got another but Please question. remove it anyway. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, I got another question for you. Uh, could you apply for several smaller projects on the same forest land if you're not sure you can get it done in um two years i think you should not um so bite one, off what you project, know you can chew yeah. get that one project because you know you can do it in 10 years and i would say get the applications ready for the others because if in six months your first project is like well we got this done then let's start applying for those other ones as we see that you have the capability and capacity to do it Excellent. Okay, great. We are at 20 minutes. So I'm going to turn it over to you can stop sharing now, Kara. Let's turn okay. over to I'm going to let turn it over to Alan. You can introduce yourself and um, start your presentation. Well, Bill, we have to figure out how I stop sharing. Stop sharing. Unfortunately. <laughs> that might hey, be a trick. Kara, can you hear me? I can. Okay, good. Thanks. Uh, so I'm just curious about the buckthorn. So where are you located in Wisconsin? Are you northern Wisconsin or what part of Wisconsin? Are um, you? I am in northern Wisconsin. Okay. Are you like what county? I'm in Bayfield. Bayfield. Okay, thanks. Are, are you seeing buckthorn up there yet? Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, for landowners, it's spread by birds. You probably already know this. It's not great food. So anytime you have a lovely spot for birds, you'll probably find more buckthorn or in someone's yard or a hedge. 
Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't sure about that because at, at least I'm St. Croix County, so south of you quite a bit. I'm uh, We're getting overrun with it here. And I, I heard you say try and control it. And that's, you can't, <laughs> there's, it's impossible. Um, and it's, we're moving towards monoculture. There's, there's no other outcome. So man, what there's, I, I can't, be hopeful even I, I don't see anything I've spent this winter just pretty much every day out there and there's I've got a couple hundred acres and there's no there's no way you can keep up it's we're losing so when you mentioned planting mid-level trees so I would need to clear cut 200 acres of not 200 but 200 ish acres of trees and then replant these other things and they're going to lose to the buckthorn as well so I'm pretty excited, but sad. Um, I'm, I know I'll let, I'll let the NRCS get in here, but this is actually a great example. Like maybe you would have to clear cut your property and site prep it, herbicide it, herbicide it. And monoculture is usually a dirty word, but maybe that's a good site for a red pine plantation. Um, something that can survive some herbicide, some like broadleaf herbicide. So there's options, but they're not they're not inexpensive and they are not, you know, what what naturally would always occur. But red pine does really do well in large stands of all like species. But yeah, yeah. maybe in your case, trying to get oak to establish sugar maple, even red maple, that might just be a terrible idea. And this is why you work with that forester to say, is this a feasible project or not? Yeah, that's that, that's going to be a bummer for people that have. I mean, if you own ten acres, that's just fine. But for everybody who owns forty acres or more, that's going to be cost prohibitive. It's we're going to lose. I'm afraid. <laughs> well, me, I don't have anything to say to that. Yeah, <laughs> there's people that that have some success. I, I I wouldn't be too too depressed about it. There's there's some people that have had some success with large acres of it it takes a lot of work though and you just got to keep at it and and chip away at it a little at a time for for many of these and and uh you can have some success so uh don't give up hope kevin and uh um uh, thanks for uh your your thoughts on that uh, i want to move on so we can get to uh, alan's chance to uh talk a little bit about the nrcs programs alan why don't you go ahead and start your presentation And we are seeing your shared screen. Go ahead. Let me unmute myself there. Okay. Uh, so everybody, yeah, I just, uh, Kevin, yeah, and everything that, that uh, was said there, I think, yeah, starting small there, work on a, a piece at a time. And and I think you, you can still have some success, but um, trying to do it all at once is probably not going to work out too well. So uh, uh, yeah, bite-sized chunks. Yep. Stick your so finger. Lighting, it sounds like <laughs> uh, bummer. That, yeah. No, I kind of understood that. That's, I'm going to drop. Thank, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Right. So my name is Alan Brown. I am the uh, state forester for the Wisconsin Natural Resources Conservation Service. Um, so we are a uh, department within the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So we are uh, a federal department. See if I can advance here. Yeah, try clicking on your presentation, then it'll, it should advance. Oh, yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. All right. So just a, a quick word first. Uh, what, what does NRCS do? So we provide technical and financial assistance to, to private landowners, uh, non-industrial. Basically, that means that you don't own a sawmill that you're selling wood to to people doing you know high volume uh, log processing there, uh, and so basically our we we uh, started as a soil conservation service back in the 1930s. In the 1990s, we uh, expanded and changed our name to the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and so started including forestry within our work. Uh, I would say in our field offices, still a lot of our employees have more of a soils or agronomic background. So 
we rely quite a bit on DNR foresters, uh, partner org organizations like Rough Grouse Society um, to really help us uh, uh, implement our, our forestry program and get technical assistance out there. Uh, NRCS, we have uh, 54 service centers scattered around the state. Uh, Northern Wisconsin, they're a bit more spread out. Uh, Southern Wisconsin, it's a bit more, almost one per county typically. Uh, we, on the financial assistance side, we have two primary programs. They're not the only ones, but they're, they're the main ones I'm going to talk about today. So that's Environmental Quality Incentives Program, EQIP, and then Conservation Stewardship Program, or CSP. And for, for uh, these programs, uh, really, the, a forest plan should be in place um, before you, you're going to do anything here, much like, much like Wiffle Gap. Um, really, that forest plan is your first step. All right, so diving into EQIP here, Environmental Quality Incentive Programs. This is really kind of our flagship program. Uh, it's ba ba basically going to be financial uh, and technical assistance for individual projects. Um, within that, uh, we have what we call practice standards. And so any, any project we help you design, it's going to have to meet those standards. So sometimes that works out where you come into it the office and you get an idea of how a project's going to go. And then we say, well, to meet the standards, we also have to do X, Y, and Z. Um, you know, that might, that might be more than you wanted to bite off. And you might say, well, okay, uh, thanks, but, but no thanks. Um, and that's perfectly fine that, that, you know, just realize that we have to meet these standards. It may not always align exactly with how you want your project to go. So, uh, you just have to make a decision there. These projects uh, are, so these are contracts that, that are uh, set up and typically the contracts go for two to three years, uh, but they, they can go for up to 10 years. So uh, they can, can stretch out a ways. Uh, again, that forested land has to be non-industrial. So you don't, you don't have a sawmill that you're operating basically. Uh, there is an income cutoff, and it's it's not too hard to meet. Basically, as long as you're not a millionaire, you, you can engage in our programs. Uh, and like I said, uh, on forested land, uh, for EQIP, you do have to have a forest plan in place before uh, we can do anything else. And the way this program works as far as cost share, uh, it's intended to be uh, about 75% or so cost share. Uh, but it is a flat rate. So we basically have economists that assign uh, values to to different components of, of a, a project. And uh, we have, av you, we kind of set up an average project. What does an average project look like? What are all the components that need to go into it? What do those cost? And then we take 75% of that total uh, and and that's the flat rate we provide. So no receipts need to be kept here. Uh, you know what what you're going to get uh, at the end of the project with this. Um, it may you know, like I said, designed to be seventy five percent, but in actuality, uh, it may end up being less than that, or it could be more than that, just based on how your project compares to the average uh, scenario that we put together. All right, Conservation Stewardship Program or CSP. So this is this one's more for landowners who've been doing a lot of work already. Uh, typically, you'll have done some equip projects. Um, you'll have solved uh, some resource concerns. Basically, resource concerns is NRCS language for uh, some some kind of uh, problem you have out in your forest that you wanna you wanna correct. Um, so you, you've you've done some work already. You've got things humming along pretty well, uh, and then you could you could apply for this program. So for these, uh, you know, th these are standard five year contract lengths, uh, and those can be renewed multiple times. And so there's there's several different payments that happen here. Uh, you're basically going to get paid for having solved those resource concerns and to to maintain that level of conservation. And then there's going to be also some additional things that, you know, additional projects that we're going to ask you to do what we call enhancements that are meant to go kind of above and beyond a uh, base level of, of, uh, of conservation. 
For this one, again, eligibility, um, you got to have current records at the Farm Service Agency. I know it's kind of confusing if you're a forest landowner and it says Farm Service Agency, but I do rest assured that uh, if you're a forest landowner, you're, you're still considered a producer and you can get Farm Service Agency records. Uh, you have to have control of the land. Um, and then the, the basic requirement is you have to be meeting our threshold um, for at least two resource concerns. So you must have done, you know, some projects or uh, that that solved two resource concerns in the past. All right, so just the general process when you're working with us. Um, so first step would be to, to contact one of our, our local service centers. The service center would be the one where your land is located. Uh, if you if you live in a different county, um, you would want the county where the land is actually located and contact that field office that, that covers that county. Uh, you, you'd want to work with them, see if your project is going to work. Um, if you have not gotten set up with the Farm Service Agency to get farm and track numbers, you would do that. Uh, those numbers are basically just how we track the, the different contracts that you might enter into uh, for these conservation programs. Uh, you would submit an application for assistance. And then those applications, we, we accept applications year round. You can submit an application any time of year. Uh, but do realize that those applications are batched uh, once or twice a year. Um, so sometimes you'll see you'll see information on those batching deadlines. Um, and so that's basically just means if you want your project to be eligible for for that, you know, that pot of money that we're we're looking at, uh, you got to have your application in before a batching deadline. Um, and then so we go through all the projects that come in, all the applications that come in, and we we rank those as far as what are the different priorities in the state, um, how much conservation is this project doing, uh, everything gets ranked, and then we basically see how far down the list of, of that ranking that our money gets us. And uh, important to recognize here, uh, much like with the Wiffle Gap program, you don't get paid until after you've done the implementation. So you need to be prepared to front all those costs uh, ahead of time. So if you're doing the project yourself, um, you know, you need to be able to purchase whatever materials you're going to need. Uh, if you're hiring a contractor, you'll, you'll need to be able to pay that contractor um, likely before you're, you're going to get that, that cost share payment. So uh, really important note there. All right, so some common practices that we do, this is more mostly on the equip side, but can also factor into CSP as well. So if you don't have a forest management plan, we do cost share those. Uh, and so a forest management plan, that's uh, basically it, it provides that that basic roadmap for you to um, whatever direction, whatever goals you have for the forest, that plan is going to tell you how to get there. Uh, it's basically a roadmap to get you to where you want to be. Uh, like I said, those are a forest plans going to be required before financial assistance uh, is available to you. Um, if the plan you're going to cost share that through NRCS, we have a list of technical service providers is what we call them. These are private consulting foresters who have done a little bit extra training to be able to write plans for NRCS. And to find a, one of those technical service providers, uh, I've, I've got the website there. Uh, and you can, that, that website has technical service providers, not just for forestry, but also agronomy and grazing and everything else. So you want to do some filtering there to, to get to what you want. So uh, you'd want to filter by Wisconsin, whatever county your land is located in. And then uh, the practice uh we, we give it a little code there, but 106 cap forest management plan. And again, uh, sometimes I get questions on these, like uh, there's there's sometimes confusion between managed forest law plan and then, uh, you know, do I have to do managed forest law plan? Absolutely not. Um, you can just get a, a forest stewardship plan written or 
Uh, some foresters use their own templates. You can you can get any plan written. Uh, if it's not a for managed forest law plan, there's no mandatory practices. There's nothing you have to do. Uh, you can let that plan just sit on the shelf and collect dust if you want to. We obviously would prefer that you don't do that. We would prefer that you are following the recommendations in the plan. But um, you know, there's there's other plan types out there besides MFL where you're not locked into any mandatory practices, if you've heard of that. Another common practice we do is called forest stand improvement. Um, that's really covers a, a wide range of different silvicultural techniques where trees are gonna be cut. It can be uh, that, that tree release that uh, 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 Kara was mentioning, can be non-commercial thinning, uh, like Wiffle Gap, we're typically not going to get involved with commercial timber sales, um, but we will offer tree marking uh, to prepare for a commercial timber sale just so that um, you can be satisfied that the logger knows which trees either to cut or which trees to leave based on how are the markings going, but that gives you a little bit of quality control. Brush management, this is basically our version of treating invasive plants. Um, so uh, for brush management, those are the woody stemmed ones. So that's your honeysuckle, buckthorn, barberry, uh, multiflora rose, all those, all that, that good stuff. Uh, for us, uh, we wanna make sure a treatment's uh, effective. So we reference UW extension fact sheets for the species that's gonna be treated. And typically what that comes down to is um, if you just cut these species, they're just gonna re-sprout back and you'll end up with three or four times as many stems as you did originally once the sprouts all get going. Um, so it, you really need to control that sprouting response, which means you either need to mechanically remove those roots or it's gonna involve some herbicide application. Um, and it's uh, like like uh, uh, Kara said, it's it's not it's not a one and done. It's you got to really keep after this. And for brush management, we do offer three years of uh, of control within a contract. So you can basically do a pretty heavy treatment in year one, uh, and then you get two years of follow up where you can try to control any sprouts of from the seed bank or. Um, you know, anything you might have missed uh, treating a stump or that kind of thing. Another common practice is tree and shrub establishment. Uh, so that's planting of native trees and shrubs, uh, either for forestry or wildlife purposes. Uh, as probably many of you are aware in Wisconsin, it's hard just to plant trees without also thinking about what might eat those trees. So we have options for browse protection. Typically this is gonna be from deer. And so we got a solid tube option. We have wire individual wire cages. Uh, we have mesh tubes. Mostly those are for conifers. Uh, and then we do offer some other uh, options such as uh, perimeter fencing um slash walls those types of things as well so plenty of options there to try to help you protect your planting from from deer browse then i just want to bring up a few funding opportunities uh you may have heard of the inflation reduction act uh there's that's basically added money to our existing program offerings so now is really a, a really uh, it's a unprecedented opportunity um, to receive financial assistance for forestry projects. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot, a lot more money than we typically do. So with the Inflation Reduction Act money, uh, it's focused on practices that have carbon storage benefit. You don't have to worry about that. That's kind of been figured out at the national level. Uh, you just have to know that the eligible practices here are, are going to be that tree and shrub establishment or the, you know, the tree planting uh, site preparation to support that establishment if necessary, the forest stand improvement uh, practice, brush management. Uh, if you're doing any prairie work, we have wildlife habitat habitat planting that, that falls under that. And then if you uh, have mixed farm farmland and, and you know with your forest, um, we also have agroforestry practices that we can apply on that cropland or pasture. Mm -hmm. Uh, such as silvo pasture, alley cropping, um, riparian forest buffers, those kinds of things, windbreaks. 
And then if you're in the northeast part of the state, we have a what's called a Joint Chiefs project up there. It's These are projects that are based on U.S. Forest Service land and then include a, a, a ring of private lands outside of that. And basically the goal is to try to do work both on the public Forest Service land and the private lands and kind of have a, a broader impact than doing things just uh, on either one alone. Um, so this project, um, th these projects have three years of funding. Uh, this one started, we're in our second year of funding right now. So um, we have one more year to go on this one. This is just a map showing some of the, the Joint Chief Project locations. You can see a lot of them are out west, but we do have a, a few in Wisconsin and uh, that large orange dot in northeast Wisconsin. That's our current project. And so these are the counties that that covers. Um, so we have uh, Langlade, Marinette, Oconto, Florence, Forest, Oneida, Menominee, and Shawano counties. And basically what we're looking at here, um, some of it's, don't get too caught up in these focus statements. Basically any forestry project that you might wanna do within that area is probably gonna be eligible. Uh, but we are looking at, you know, if there's still some blowdown that's, uh, that needs to be cleaned up from either the 2019 or 22, 2022 uh, wind, wind events that came through there, um, that's a focus for this project. We're looking at water quality and brook trout habitat, and then also wildlife habitat for golden wing warblers. So that's going to be more early successional um, aspen regeneration type of things, and then also monarch butterfly. So uh, you know, again, planting of prairies or or uh, nectar and and um, uh, caterpillar plants. All right, so with that, that's the end of my presentation. I can take any questions. Um, Alan, I've been dropping the links. The there has a question. <laughs> I've been dropping <laughs> links to the different programs in the chat and to the uh, the find your your technical service provider link in there as well. Is what's the a common or the best way for folks who haven't worked with the NRCS before to start this? the the process for getting one like getting into the equip or or, or CSP what how would you suggest someone who has never worked with them before to get started in that yeah so the the best place to start and I don't know if you've dropped that link in yet Bill but um, we have a service center locator um, and so you would basically that just ask you what state you're in and what county uh, your land is in. And then I'll give you the contact information for that field office that services that county. And the best thing to do is start out with a, a phone call to that to that field office and kind of describe where you're at with things, uh, you know, what you have forest land, kind of what you're interested in, some potential projects you're thinking about, and you can go from there. Oh, I was just reading the uh, Gabriella had a nice comment about um, Forest if Forest County she's doing um, controlling beaver and some work like that. I, I was wondering about uh, you didn't put fences in the in the list on on uh, tree planting yet, and I was going to jump on that. And I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, I think uh, that tends to be more effective. And but let, fewer people are interested in that. Does this include electric electrified fences as well? Uh, not electric fences, not not for forest regeneration anyways. No, these are typically more um, uh, um, hard plastic fencing. You know, it's intended to be temporary. Um, and yeah, it's it's it, so fencing, it's, it is very effective. It can be a lot of work to put those up and you have to make sure you maintain them so that you don't get any holes or, you know, any branches falling on them. Uh, that all of a sudden the, the deer will let in are coming in, but uh, for larger scale uh, projects, fences are often more economical than doing tree tubes or uh, cages or that type of thing. Um, you just you know it just scales out where putting a fence around the outside is is uh, cost less money than trying to protect each individual tree. Um, so yeah, we do offer that. Um, I know, especially in the northeast part of the state, there's some contractors that that will do that work. 
uh, outside of that area, it may be hard to find somebody to do it. Um, but if you're willing to take a shot at it yourself, um, that's also a possibility. Are there are there certain practices that tend to get a higher get high, prioritized higher than others in the in your list? Is like invasive control or tree planting or water quality control? Is there anything that that will get people more likely to get a chance to get the funding than than others? So right now with that Inflation Reduction Act money, the the practices that were on that list are those are the going to be priority practices. So that that tree planting, the forest stand improvement, brush management is on there. Um, there's a few others that that are on there. Though those are all going to be priority practices. Uh, otherwise, um, what we have let's get into the weeds a little bit, but we have what are called local work groups. And those are basically, uh, they, they get kind of their own pot of money. Uh, usually it's four or five counties kind of clustered together. And that local work group basically decides the priorities for that cluster of counties. Um, so to some degree, there is some local priorities as well that get factored in there. And, and that can be different from, from local work group to local work group. There was a question in the chat about um, getting a a cost estimate before you apply for a either either program and and, and Carrie, you can jump in here too. What's what's your thought on do you, whether you need it or if it's a good idea to have the cost estimate before you start doing the work? It is I don't I don't think it's needed, is it? But it's a good idea. Was that is that your perspective? Yeah, I I agree. Not necessary, but a very very good idea. Uh, you you want to know what you're what you're in for and compare that to the cost share dollars you're going to get and see how that stacks up. And that's also a great time if you're looking at getting a contractor for that work. It's a great time to just see if contractors are available, how much they might be charging. Um, you know. Sometimes if they're really got a lot of work on their plate, they might say, yeah, I can do it, but it's going to, you know, you're going to get the the cost or, you know, they're going to quote you the price of, yeah, I got a lot of work and I don't really want to do it, but I will if you pay me enough type of price. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great idea. Uh, what you don't want to do is get stuck. You know, you sign that contract and then, you know, you're, you're basically committed to it and find out that there's not a contractor available. So. Definitely want to do that homework ahead of time. Kara, you want to? What's your perspective for the Wiffle Gap program regarding a need versus a good idea for a cost estimate? Very much the same. Um, if something was on the edge of what is logic, not logical, on what is on the edge of what is deemed a normal practice, I would want to see a cost estimate. If someone was trying a different method, perhaps, but definitely for standard practices, it's helpful, not necessary, because we've set our not to exceed rates based on what we've seen in the past. But like Alan pointed out, different contractors are going to have vastly different rates sometimes. There was a, a, a question about uh, CSB and the forest management plan done. I and you may have mentioned this, Alan, about um, the CSP. If there's folks that are in the MFL program, Managed Forest Law program, DNR's uh, uh, Forest Management, Forest Stewardship program. Do they are they already set up to be uh, um, well equipped or well positioned to get into the CSP program? Um. It, well, it it depends. You know, it's. It, in, you could be an MFL and, you know, you've done some, some of the practices in your plan, then, then yes. Uh, if, if you're an MFL and, you know, it's, you don't have a mandatory practice till 10 years down the road and you haven't really done much else, you know, maybe, maybe not. Um, so it's really going to come down to uh, um, uh, those, what resource concerns you might have and um, if those have been addressed or not. There's a couple of questions in the, in the chat about applying for both, maybe either like a, an NRCS program and and Wiffle Gap. Is there, and this is a question to both Alan and Cara. Cara is is does it make sense to apply for both for certain projects? Is there or is it a lot of overlap? Is it is it better to to focus on one versus another? 
Well, you, you can't use both for the same project. So just, just realize that right off the bat. If you do apply for both, you have to make a decision at some point of which one, which one you're actually going to use. Uh, you know, you, you can't, you can't double dip basically. Um, and I, I have done that too. It's not an ideal, but if someone is applying for both, we decide when they got one, all right, it's time to drop the other. But again, back to, we have a set amount of money for everybody in Wisconsin. Once we encumber that money, no one else is going to be able to get it. So cancel your grant as soon as possible. I mean, there is a point when if you cancel it the day after you get it, the program can shift that to someone on the wait list. But if you wait too long, we just lose it. I could see one scenario where you might use both programs, and that could be where um, you maybe apply for one of the programs for funding to get a, ma a, plan a management plan written and another one for controlling invasives. Yeah, I see Kara's giving me thumbs up. Um, Alan, is what you're thinking? What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's certainly the the, uh, the not double dipping is you know for the same project. So if you have multiple projects going on and you want to combine different funding sources, uh, or if you want to do Wiffle Gap for one project and Equip for another, yeah, you can, you can certainly do that. And the plans ones, because you both kind of fund for plans. Is there um, does it is there does it make sense to do one for one and one for the other, or is is one program better for invasive control and another is better for getting a management plan, or is that more of a personal choice kind of thing? It's going to be personal choice. You know, it's I think probably paperwork wise, maybe the state's a little easier to work with. <laughs> uh, <laughs> We might have a little more money to offer, but you know that it's going to come with a little more bureaucracy potentially. So, um, you know, it's it's all going to be a, a personal choice um, for forest plans. I will say, right now, NRCS has had a, a lot of demand for forest plans, and we are um, really just focusing on funding folks who have not ever had a forest plan before, um, just to try to to keep up with the demand there and prioritize things. Um, so we want to help people who are just getting started on their forestry journey um, rather than, um, you know, it's not that we don't think you're important if you already have a plan and you want to renew one, but uh, we just, we're forced to prioritize at this point and that's the way we've done it. So uh, if you're in that more renewal type of situation, maybe Wiffle Gap's probably uh, the better option for you. Yeah, Kara, we talked briefly uh, yesterday about paperwork involved with signing up for Wiffle Gap. Here's your chance to to sell the <laughs> Alan's note about it being easier to fill out and, and apply for Wiffle Gap. Go ahead. Uh, you can I'll stop sharing, you guys. Alan, if you want. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Sir. Yeah. I'll tell you guys, if I if it's for a plan, I like to ask landowners, can you come to my office and I will print out all of the forms necessary, and we will fill it out and sign it together, scan it and send it in in one day. So let's do that, especially if it's for making a plan. If you have a funky underplanting project and you got to do some TSI to make it happen, I will probably want to do a site visit, but I may also fill out the forms and right after our site visit, in the truck, on the hood of the truck, we'll fill it out so I can send it in. It is very fast. And again, I want you guys to get in line as soon as possible for funding. And I can share a screen later if people still have time and show you a little bit more about what our grant application looks like. Why don't you, why don't you go ahead? Wait, wait, wait there's, uh, this is a good time for that. Good segue. Okay. And I saw another question in the chat, which we'll talk about later. Um, so right here, this is the scariest part of the grant. And you see all those little codes? That's what I fill out. And I'll do a needs determination, it's very short. Scariest part, and that's all my work. Um, and there's the example of like, you don't really need to know what those codes mean right off the bat, but I know what they mean. And I can also give you a document that tells you what they mean. Like I just wrote this up for a landowner. Oh, I'm just, I have to drag it over to you guys. 
I don't know where my mouse is. Oh, here it is. This was all supposed to be done. So this yeah. is right from my private lands handbook and you guys can look this up too. Tells you exactly what those codes mean. So on your expense ledger, if you write down site prep heavy and you know you can get a maximum of $192 an acre, you tell me who, like my contractor charged me $500 to do my field. I easily fill it out and that's on the reimbursement side. So it is a very easy application. Um, any other questions? I can, here's the application itself. You just fill out name, address. I even put in the legal description for you guys. Sign it, date it. I fill this stuff out and I keep this in my office and when it's time to reimburse you, I fill this out. And you guys would probably get a check within a month, month and a half of the day I I turn that in for reimbursement. Any other questions? Also, it's taxable benefit. If we give you a lot of money, we want a little bit of it back in taxes. <laughs> Not us personally. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Thank you, Bill. The state, it is a taxable benefit. So other ways of keeping records, if you take pictures, I love it if people drop the GPS coordinates written on the photo and your name because that can be in a file and somebody can look it up in five years and know exactly where that picture was taken and on what day. I'm going to stop sharing. And Avenza Maps is a program that all DNR foresters have access to. I'm not promoting that program specifically, but it's free. It's easy. There's a lot of other ones, but this that particular program, I can share um, GPS stuff with very, very easily. It's. I wonder if we can give a quick, quick, quick answer to the question about using an experimental method that was recognized. This one, that in this, but from Susan out of uh, Minnesota, research based. What's uh, what's your guys' thought on not necessarily tried and true practice, fund, getting funding for that? Is is it is that something that you've seen done before? Is it, is it a problem if someone tries something really out there that isn't tried and true and they don't get it funded? Uh, Kara, you can go first. Okay, good. Because I just pulled up the, if this person is looking at um, experimental methods, the Minnesota Silviculture Library. So it is maybe possible to cost share some of that through Wiffle Gap. Um, but you would need to talk through with this with your DNR forester, and I would probably go several levels of management above myself to find out if it's possible to um, to it's share hard. that or to cost yeah. share that. Because if yeah. oh, if there ahead. is research, maybe. Um, but we would probably do a very small portion of that project, and then I would love it if you added it to the Great Lakes Silviculture Library. Alan, what's your what's your guys's perspective on on something like that? Yeah, so for our, our main programs, we're usually not at the tip of the spear um, with that kind of stuff. We're we're usually dealing with fairly settled science, proven practices. Um, so it's it, it, depending on what it is, potentially, but um, we're probably not going to be quite as um, uh, quite as open to that as maybe Wiffle Gap would be. So. If, if there is research out there, it's something I can look at and I can create that scenario and then we can start offering it. But that's a that's going to be a multi-year process. So um, we do have some prog programs called uh, Conservation Innovation Grants, uh, which is more meant for that kind of experimental type of type of things. I don't know as much about that program, um, but it is out there and uh, we have program staff that that can help folks uh, walk through that if if it's something they're interested in. Oh, I do want to just say real quick on this specific one. I see that it's like prairie seeds. Wait a minute, I do tree things. So <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a caveat. Thank you. 
All right. Well, thanks, uh, Karen Allen. And thanks, everybody, for participating. We've reached uh, one o'clock and I don't want to take up any, uh, more than we we uh, suggested we were going to take. So thanks for participating. I'll be sending a uh, an email with the links that we talked about to the different programs and how to connect to service providers and um, and how to how to watch out the other presentations in the series. So thanks, everyone, for participating and have a great the rest of your day.